Okay. So again, thank you so much all for being here. Just to get through introductions really quickly, I'm Christine Wolf. I founded Writer's Haven, which is sort of a whole bunch of different things. We do a lot of um, community building and education for writers, authors, all different types of literary folks. Um, I have uh, so many things that I could add, but I just want to get right to Joe. Joe is a publishing attorney. He's a literary agent. Uh, he has so much to share with us. And um, one thing to know is that anybody who sent questions to us when you registered, I've taken all of those uh, comments and shared them with Joe. And then when the recording comes your way, or if you're already looking at the recording now, um, in that email, there'll also be Joe's comments on those mm -hmm. questions if they don't already get answered in this webinar, either during the course of his presentation or in the Q&A at the end. So Joe, I'm going to hand it over to you just to share any other exciting news that you have before you start your presentation, <laughs> because you've got some really sure. good news to share about one of your authors. Oh, yeah, yeah. Recent so, weeks. yes, yeah. Thank you. Thank you again. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for coming, everyone. Um, do this webinar a lot. Uh, I also teach a um, publishing life course at, at Emerson College and at my alma mater, St. Bonaventure University. So I do this all the time. So I'm really excited. Um, I think you'll take a, a lot from this from not only an intellectual property standpoint, First Amendment standpoint, but from book contracts. But yeah, the exciting news that you were alluding to is uh, from my literary agency, one of my authors made the um, Wall Street Journal in USA Today bestseller list last week. So that's always a uh, fun, uh, nice way to sort of end the summer <laughs> right before Labor Day. Uh, so that's that's always good. So um, so yeah, well, there's a ton to get to. So let's, uh, you know, I'm just going to minimize this here. Hold on. You can see my screen. Everybody can see it. Yeah, it's right now, I think in presentation mode, I can see all the slides down the left. Oh yeah, hold on, let me uh, do the slideshow. Okay, is that is that better? Definitely on my end, hopefully okay, everybody great. can see too. Okay, so of course there wouldn't be a legal presentation without a disclaimer. <laughs> so uh, just as an FYI, this is for education purposes only. It's not legal advice. If you do need legal advice, of course, um, you know, contact an attorney near you. It doesn't create an attorney-client um, relationship between us. Of course, if you want to reach out to me after this, you know you're 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 free to do so. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about copyright law, trademark law, libel, right of privacy. That's the first part of the presentation, and then the second part is uh, book contracts. So let's get started with uh, copyright law. So where does it come from? It actually comes from the Constitution, Article One, Section Eight, and specifically the language is Congress shall have the power to promote the progress of science and the useful arts uh, by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. This is actually where we get patent law as well. So copyright law and patent law are uh, based in federal law. So uh, the question about copyright that I get all the time is, well, how do you get a copyright? Well, there's two parts to it. And the first part is that your work actually needs to be copyrightable. And what does that mean? Well, in legalese, <laughs> in Section one of the, 101 of the Copyright Act, it means uh, that your work has to be an original work of authorship fixed in a tangible medium of expression. Okay, so we're going to get into what that means. We're going to distill that down into, sort of into English here. So what is an original work? It means that the work was independently created. Essentially, you didn't copy and paste it from somewhere. And then it has a minimum amount of uh, creativity. Okay, this is a very low bar to meet. However, there are examples of things that aren't considered original because there's not enough minimum amount of creativity. For example, a phone book. It's just an alphabetical listing of names and numbers. There isn't creative, excuse me, a minimum amount of creativity. Same thing for recipes themselves as mere lists of ingredients. Now, those ingredients, of course, can be you know um, protected as trade secrets. Uh, but in terms of just writing them down, um, they're at least under copyright um, uh, copyright law, they're not uh, deemed original enough. Okay, so first step, work has to be original. Then you have to fix your work. Essentially, that means it has to be locked in a permanent state. So the example is that, you know, you save your novel, your nonfiction work on Microsoft Word, boom, it's fixed. Okay, that's, that's very, very easy to do. And then lastly, copyright law protects expression. It does not protect ideas. Okay, so an example is, you know, idea, if you have an idea for a movie about toys, you go around and tell people, oh, I have an idea for a movie about toys. That can't be copyrighted. But the expression of the idea, you write a screenplay called Toy Story. Now that can be copyrighted. So it has to be original, fixed, and it has to um, uh, uh, pertain to expression of ideas. Okay, so that's the first part. So let's assume that your work is copyrightable. 
The second part is that you want to register your work. And why do you want to register your copyright with the Copyright Office? Well, you can't file a lawsuit and be eligible for what are called statutory damages without it. And those can range from as little as $750 to $30,000 per work in French. It's ser serious, excuse me, some serious dough if you're... Um, a plaintiff bringing a lawsuit. And it's also possible to recover up to $150,000 for willful infringement. That means that you um, sort of intended to commit copyright infringement. Um, you know, uh, the, the other thing that you have to think about too, you know, outside of that is that there's this um, copyright small claims court that was just uh, created a few years ago. And those are for um, claims up to $30,000. So for the majority of you, I would assume that's where, where it would be. Um, uh, and then the second question I get is, you know, when should I register my copyright? Well, it depends on what, you know, where you are in sort of your, um, you know, your book and what you're trying to do it for self-published authors. You want to file it when you're finished writing your book, you have the final copy. Okay. For traditionally published authors, or if say you're doing, assuming you're publishing with a hybrid, um, the publisher will likely do this for you. And the statute says that you have to register it within three months after publication. So if you're with a, a company, they're likely, excuse me, you don't likely have to do anything. Um, the, the, the publisher will do that for you. Okay, so that's how to obtain a copyright. How do you register it? Okay, it's actually really easy to do. Uh, you can just go on copyright.gov and they have guidance, they have tutorials, they'll walk you right through it. Um, and these are the fees the last time I checked, they may have changed, but it's relatively simple and relatively inexpensive. Um, $65, um, you can do it online or for a paper application, which I don't know who would do that these days, $125. Um, and there's also group registrations, which I just wanted to make you aware of. And those are um, for unpublished works, which allows you to register up to 10 unpublished works of the same kind with the same application. So instead of filing 10 separate registrations, you can have one registration for 10 works, but those works have to be the same kind. So 10 articles, 10 books, you know, you, you, you get the idea. Okay, so that's how you register your copyright. So, okay, let's pretend, you know, for you have a copyright. So what do you actually get with it? Well, for, you know, any of us, you know, sitting in this presentation today, for any book that we create, our copyright lasts for the life, our lives, plus an additional 70 years. Um, for pseudonymous, anonymous, or works, um, work made for hire, it's a little different. Copyright endures for a term of 95 years from the year of its first publication, when it's you know, first published, or um, 125 years from the year it's created, whichever expires first. Then there are works published prior to 1978, um, and the term will vary. And you can go to this if you're ever you know, wanting to know, and we'll get into the public domain, but this is such a great resource here to figure out um, whether a work is still under copyright or not. Um, it can be very, very um, complex and confusing, especially for works before 1978, because there's like a whole formula uh, for certain works. So I would highly recommend, um, you know, going to this uh, uh, website here. Um, they have a huge list of um, uh, uh, different works when they're published, and it, you, know, you can figure out when they're um, in the public domain or if they're still under copyright protection. Okay, so that's the duration, but what do you actually get with a copyright? Well, Section 106 gives you a bundle of rights, okay? You have a right to reproduce and make copies of your work. You can create derivative works. You can distribute copies to the public. Um, by sale, for example, you of course selling your book, um, renting, lending, etc. You can uh, publicly perform your work. So for our purposes, like a dramatization of your work, uh, you could publicly display the work um, and write to perform sound recordings publicly through digital audio transmission. It's likely not going to uh, be the case for people who are writing books, but that is a right that you get under um, Copyright Act. Okay, so um, now that we know sort of what it does, what you know, what you get from it. Will your work actually be eligible for this? Um, so what does the copyright law actually protect? Well, um, it, you know, of course, protects literary works for our purposes, you know, novels, nonfiction, books, poems, articles, essays. I'm not going to go through the list here, but you can see basically a lot of, you know, whatever creative work you can think of, um, uh, they're essentially um, uh, uh, protecting it okay. under copyright law. Um, so uh, those are sort of the basics as to what copyright law is. So what about copyright infringement? Uh, well, that occurs when a copyrighted work is uh, distributed, reproduced, performed, publicly displayed, or made into a derivative work without the permission of the copyright owner, essentially doing any, or excuse me, doing any of this stuff without the copyright owner's permission. 
Um, that's why copyright is often referred to as a negative right. It's the right of you, the author, to restrain others from copying your original work. So what constitutes infringement? Like, what is it? Um, well, the, generally, the test is what's called substantial similarity. So what does that mean? That means that the defendant had access to your work, and the, the defendant's work is excuse me, substantially similar to protected aspects of your work. And federal courts have their own tests. So like the Second Circuit in New York has its own test. The Ninth Circuit in California has its own test. But generally speaking, what they do is they sort of excise the uncopyrightable elements of the work and then compare the copyrightable um, you know, elements to see how similar the work is, to see if it really is substantially similar. Okay, so that's copyright for me. What about public domain? Um, so a work of authorship is in the public domain if it's no longer under copyright protection or if it failed to meet the requirements for copyright protection. Once upon a time, there are all these formalities that you had to um, meet um, for your work to be under copyright. And if you didn't do that, like for instance, if you didn't put a copyright notice in your book once upon a time, um, your work might fall into the public domain. Okay. Um, so works in the public domain may be used freely without you know, permission. And this is another great resource before I uh, spoke about the, that list. This is wonderful, especially for people who write historical fiction. Uh, and they update this every year, uh, every January 1st of every year. Um, and right now, works from 1927 are entering the public domain. So Great Gatsby is now in the public domain. The Sun Also Rises is in the public domain. Um, I think To the White House is in the public domain. Uh, but yeah, definitely check this out. Duke Law, um, they do this every year. And they have a huge list of works, not just you know literary works, but all different types of creative works. Um, so if you do write historical fiction, uh, you know it may be a, a, a big resource for, for, for you to have. Okay, so how do I actually tell if my work is in the public domain? Um, there's It's great circular. So that's the other thing I wanted to mention about the Copyright Office. They have really great informationals just about the basics of copyright law. And this one um, is called how to investigate the copyright status um, you know, of, of my work. And it tells you sort of the steps that you need to um, go through to determine if it's in the public domain. Um, okay, so that's public domain. Now we're gonna switch gears here um, to joint authorship. Some of you may be working with another person, uh, whether an illustrator or another author. Um, uh, so you would essentially be joint authors under um, Copyright Act. So what does that mean? Uh, well, a joint work is a work prepared by two or more individuals with the intent. That's the key here. You have to have the intent that your separate con contributions, whether you're both writing it or someone's illustrating it and you're writing it, they have to be merged into a single work. A joint author can also be an organization or a corporation under the definition um, you know, for work for hire. And the copyright should be registered in both of your names. That would be key Okay, when you're registering it. Make sure to register it in both of your names. Yeah, I alluded to, you know, work made for hire in the last slide, but, you know, you know what, what is it? And there are two ways for a work to be um, a work made for hire. One is, you know, you've prepared a work uh, within the scope of your employment, and you may have actually signed a contract uh, with your employer. I know I did in the past when I was uh, uh, an in-house attorney, essentially stating that anything that I created in, in my scope of employment would belong to my employer, it wouldn't belong to me. Uh, the other way is that the work has to be specially ordered or commissioned. Okay, and there are nine ways um, that you know under the statute. Okay, as a contribution to a collective work, um, as part of a motion picture or um, AV work, as a translation, a supplementary work. Think of a supplementary work as like um, uh, a workbook to like a textbook, um, as a compilation, as an instructional text, as a test, an answer material for a test. Or as an atlas. So you can see it's very limited. So that's why in contracts, um, if it is a work for hire contract that you're signing, you'll see language that says, um, you know, we understand, you know, the parties understand that the, uh, the work is a work for hire. However, if it doesn't qualify as a work for hire under copyright law, you're going to assign your copyright to the work to the publisher. That's sort of how they get around it if it doesn't qualify for it. Okay, so this is, uh, this next slide is really a huge part of my um, practice. I get the questions all the time. How do I use copyrighted material? Can I use this? Can I use that? Um, so of course, the best practice is always to ask for permission. However, uh, there are limitations to that. Uh, you know, that's great if you can do it. Uh, uh, but however, it can be very expensive, or you might not be able to find the copyright owner. 
um, or the copyright owner doesn't get back to you. So what do you do in that instance? Well, you have to make sure that your work falls under fair use. Okay, so what is fair use? And thank God for fair use because we wouldn't be able to um, write a lot of you know material <laughs> with without it. Uh, it's essentially, um, uh, it carves into the law exceptions to getting permission. You're able to use limited uses of copyrighted material without having to get the copyright owner's permission. So how do you do this? Unfortunately, it's complicated. It's very fact dependent. It's on a case by case basis and courts don't always follow precedent. Um, the only true way to know if it's a fair use is to litigate it. Of course, no one ever wants to do that. So what can you do um, if you want to use copyrighted material? Well, you can look at a few factors under Section 107. You can try to predict how a judge may rule. Okay, so there are four factors that courts look at. Okay, you have the purpose and the character of the use, and that's really the big one these days in terms of sort of what turns on whether something is fair use or not. Of course, you have to look at all four factors in totality, but that's you know the big one these days. The nature of the copyright at work, the amount or substantiality of the portion used, um, and there's some big misconceptions in terms of that, so I will address that as well, and the effect of the use on the market um, of the work. So let's go through all four of them. So what is the purpose and character of the use? So it concerns itself with why you're actually using the copyrighted work. Remember, the whole point of copyright is to progress the arts and sciences. So the courts are asking you, why are you using this copyrighted material? What's the purpose? Are you just doing it because you know you, you think it'll make your, your book better? <laughs> uh, there has to be a point to it, right? And in the statute, there are some purposes that are generally favored. Criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, research. This is in the preamble. You can actually look up the statute if you want, section 107. Um, this is like the paragraph before those four factors. That I just mentioned, but be careful. Just because your work is generally within one of these purposes doesn't automatically mean it's going to be fair use. You still have to go through every factor, okay? Um, there And there are other purposes that are generally not favored, like commercial uses, but be careful. It's the same, essentially the same logic. Just because your work is commercial doesn't automatically mean it's not going to be fair use. And to be honest, what work isn't commercial these days, right? Everyone's writing for money. So, um, uh, uh, anyway, just just you know, be careful with that. Just don't make um, you know, uh, rash assumptions that your work will be fair use or won't be fair use just based on some information. So that's factor one, um, at least the, the beginning part. The, the, so really the nuts and bolts of factor one is transformative use. Okay, maybe you have heard of this concept. Um, and this, uh, the courts have come up with uh, sort of a, a definition of um, this. You're essentially transforming the work into something new. Again, remember I had said the whole point of copyright is to progress the arts and sciences. So what you wanna do is give that copyright at work new meaning, a new message, new utility. You have to do something new with it. Um, and in addition, um, the Supreme Court just had um, a fair use case um, dealing with Andy Warhol a few months ago, and we'll get into that in a few slides. Um, so in addition to transforming your work, you also now need to justify the purpose. However, that hasn't really been litigated yet. So there are really some questions surrounding that. Um, and we'll, we'll get into that in the next few slides. But the, you know, the big thing is that you want to transform your work. So for example, if you've written a book about, say, a you know, famous musician, and you want to include some lyrics, um, you know, lyrics are copyrighted. Their uh, music publishers are highly litigious. Uh, so if you just include those lyrics and don't actually comment on them, you don't analyze them, um, you're not transforming them. You're, you're just putting it into the work. If you're analyzing them, you're... You're, you're transforming them. You're giving them new meaning. You're giving them new context, right? So that's what you really want to focus on in terms of transformative use in factor one. Okay, so that's factor one. Then factor two is the nature of the copyrighted work. Um, it really asks whether the work that you're taking from, is it factual or is it creative? And, and courts favor creative works. And that's because it really just goes towards like the theory behind copyright law. There's been this romantic notion of the author throughout copyright history from you know the you know the beginning of our country that excuse me that essentially authors create something out of nothing. Um, so you're this like romantic you know genius. <laughs> so they want to this sort of romantic notion of being you know a genius. Um, so they want to reward you for that. So any creative works you know books music movies etc. That's going to be more protected than if your work is like factual, and that's because courts want facts to be out in society. They want us to be smarter. They want us to be um, you know, essentially more educated. They want us to take advantage of factual 
works. Okay, and the other thing that um, it also talks about, which it isn't written in the statute, but in the case law, it's essentially, they say that you have the right to control your first publication. So any unpublished works, they're going to protect those um, uh, compared to works that have already been uh, uh, published. Then there's factor three. And this is where the big misconception of fair use occurs. Okay, um, I get these questions all the time. Well, I've only used 10% of the work. I used a couple lines. I used two chapters. It's all fact dependent and less is always more. There's no bright line rule. It, it's all context dependent, okay? So I, that's why I always say, write as much as you need to get your point across and nothing more. And of course, always cite to it and then transform it as well. You know, uh, add, new, add that meaning to it, add that um, context, the new context, the new interpretation, et cetera. So that's, you know, it's, it, it seems like easy enough for text, right? But what about images? Okay, you're using the whole image, right? Uh, so in this case, I'm just curious here. I'm going to stop sharing my screen for, or wait, hold on, let me see. I'm just curious. Can I just get a poll? I'm, I'm so excited. Who here thinks this is fair use? This is, um, so this is the plaintiff's work, of course. This is the defendant's. I always get mixed up in terms of the name, but I'm just curious. Would you think this is fair use or not? Just by looking at it. And there's no right or wrong answer. Why don't why don't you think it's fair use, Christine? I'm just curious. It's just literally the same picture with mm -hmm. stuff drawn mm -hmm. over on top of it. Well, believe it or not, it is fair use, <laughs> uh, and that's because they trend in the court's eyes. They transformed the photograph into there's a totally new message, a totally new um, creation. Uh, with the guitar. Um, I, I thought the same thing when I first saw this. Like, There's no way this is fair use, but it is. Um, compare that to the Andy Warhol case that just came out. Um, and this went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And um, uh, they determined that, so this was the original photograph that um, Vanity Fair photographer um, Lynn Goldsmith took. And this is the silk screen that Andy Warhol created based on this photograph. And sort of what happened there is that he went beyond the license. He created like 16 of them. He was only supposed to create one of them. Um, and the question became, is this silkscreen, is it fair use? Um, is it transformative? Has he created new meaning, new utility? Um, and uh, the district court said no. The second circuit said yes. And then the Supreme Court said no, it wasn't. Action infringed her derivative work right. They thought essentially sort of the same thing with this, where you didn't really do anything different here. They the, the, the silkscreen was to be used in a magazine, just like the photograph. So they were essentially used for the same purpose. So what happened here is that the fair use test has changed. Um, so in addition to transforming the content, the Supreme Court now requires a compelling justification where the original use and your use, which would be the secondary use, it shares a closely similar purpose and character. So this is where you sort of have to like justify your purpose. So if you're, um, if you're including an article um, or you know any information in your book, the the you know potentially the purposes are different. That article might be a scholarly article. And now you're putting it into sort of a trade book. So the purposes might be a little different. The issue is when it becomes similar. However, this just came out a few months ago. So no one really knows where this is going to go. So there's a question as to like, okay, that makes sense. You have to have a compelling justification if both of them are similar. But what on earth is a compelling justification? No one, no one knows yet. So uh, it's still... Uh, the, the litigation is is I'm very excited to see what it is because it'll you know make my life easier. It'll give me answers. Uh, but right now, what you need to do is essentially transform the content. Um, then, of course, make sure it doesn't um, uh, 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 interfere with the marketplace. But also, you need to look at why you're taking these materials um, and really justify your purpose. So, um, you know, I don't really agree with the court here. I thought it was fair use, but they you know thought it was a derivative work right um, you know violation. Uh, so here we are with a, you know, a, a new portion of this test. Okay. So that's factor one, two, and three. So what about factor four? This is the effect on the market. So one and four are essentially most important. Um, so you want to make sure that your use isn't going to essentially affect any potential licensing market for the work. So if you could have realistically purchased or licensed the work, that fact weighs against a finding of fair use. However, you have to look to the effect of your use. This is where everything is sort of tied together. Look to the purpose. Are you using this for research purposes? Are you using this for, you know, you're going to share a story or um, a work with you know, 
your friends, private individuals, there's not going to be an effect on the market there. However, you know, if you're selling it on Amazon, um, yeah, there, there could be, uh, you know, and, and effect on the market. So that's where you really want to um, look at this factor as well. Um, so I just wanted to put this all together in, um, you know, a famous case here from the eighties. This is Harper and Road, the nation enterprises comes from the Supreme court. So, um, uh, sorry, let me minimize this. So, you can see it. so President Ford wrote a memoir, A Time to Heal, which was to be published by Harper and Rowe. And Harper contracted with Time to publish an excerpt of Ford's account of his pardon of um, former President Nixon. The nation, however, was provided with a copy of the memoir, um, and they scooped Time, and they published approximately 300 words from the manuscript. And Harper sued the nation for copyright infringement. So I could assume just based on the con just the, uh, the context here that this isn't going to be fair use. She, you know, what they did was acting in bad faith. So, I, of course, it wasn't fair use. So why wasn't it fair use? Let's go through some of the factors here. So two, uh, factor two, it was unpublished. And President Ford has every right to control where he has first publication. Um, secondly, although the memoir was factual, their work had expressive value. The nation published subjective descriptions and portraits of public figures whose power lies in the author's individualized expression. So before I had said, you know, they, um, the courts protect more creative works than factual works. Yes, a memoir is factual, but the writing of it, of course, is expressive. So there is that creative element to it. Uh, and then, although the amount taken was small, remember they only took 300 words, it constituted a substantial portion of the work because the excerpt was the heart of the work. It was essentially why people were buying the book in the first place. Why did you pardon President Nixon? Uh, so I, I bring this up because you could take a small amount, but if it is the heart of the work, um, that will be a strike against you. And then, of course, it affected the market because the nation had to cancel its, um, or sorry, time had to cancel its um for serial rights contract with um, Harper Collins. Okay, so that's copyright law. And now we're going to switch gears to uh, First Amendment. And you know, here is the language from the Constitution. You have uh, uh, all seen. I'm not going to go uh, uh, into it. So you now let's get into what we're going to be talking about today. So um, I'm sure you've all heard this. It's a free country. I can say what I want. Uh, well, not exactly. Um, there are unprotected forms of speech, for example, obscenity, defamation, incitement. Um, today we're going to be talking about defamation. So uh, what are some basics um, of defamation? So unlike copyright law and trademark law, well, there are state trademark laws. Um, uh, uh, but generally speaking, defamation is governed by state law. Um, and the elements of a defamation claim you know, come from you know, each state. Okay? And there are two forms of defamation. There's the libel and slander. Libel is the written form, and slander is the spoken form. Um, and although there are 50 uh, uh, defamation laws on the books, um, generally speaking, they're very similar enough to determine what is liable. There are essentially four elements to it. The defendant published a false statement of fact. The statement is about the plaintiff. The statement harmed the reputation of the plaintiff. And the statement was published with some level of fault. Uh, and we're going to go through each one of these. So uh, let's go through the first one. The defendant published a false statement of fact. And what this means essentially, the statement was uttered or distributed to a person other than than the defendant. If I wrote um, you know, a statement and I just showed it to you and there's no one else present, that's not defamation. It has to be published in, uh, 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 you know, for, for a third party to, to view it, okay? Next, the statement is about the plaintiff. And this is the key thing for all uh, libel, uh, sort of, uh, uh, when I do legal reads, uh, uh, analysis for, for, for libel. Uh, so the statement doesn't explicitly need to be about the plaintiff. There can be enough identifying information where the reader or the listener can recognize who the statement is about. Okay, uh, and you know we, we can go in this because I know there's there's some questions, and I'll I'll get to the Q and A when we're done. Uh, but essentially, changing names is likely not enough. There are many things that you can do, but you could change genders, you can change, you essentially create a composite character, um, or do what you can to anonymize the person. It's all a risk assessment, right? Uh, if you think this person is going to sue you, tread lightly. If you don't think this person is ever going to find the books, for example, if you're self-published, or even if you're traditionally published, you just don't think they're going to read it, um, you know, it, you may be willing, more willing to take on that risk. Um, you can change genders, physical characteristics, geographic locations, um, and the reason why I say this, there are two layers to this, right? There's one, will that person actually be able to identify it's them? But in a court of law, 
a reasonable person, the jury has to determine themselves based on all the evidence if what you've written um, is about that person. So there's two layers to it, right? They really have this. This is sort of what I'm getting at. As they have to de- oops, me. they have to determine if the words you're writing are of and concerning that person. Then, of course, if it ruined the reputation, all that other stuff. Uh, but this is really just about identifying the plaintiff. Okay. And I bring this up because sometimes um, you may write something about somebody and they're involved in a group. And this is called group libel. Okay. And here's like a, a, an interesting example. Okay. This was Texas Beef Group, the um, Winfrey. This is, of course, a broadcast of Oprah's show. Um, it was about mad cow disease. And the broadcast was not in the court size, not of and concerning um, Texas cattle ranchers who were the plaintiffs in this case, because the statements that were made on the show concerned all cattle ranchers in the U.S. You couldn't just say, oh, yeah, that's about them. Um, so essentially, the bigger the group, the the harder it is to claim that something is um, about one specific uh, uh, person, right? Okay, so what about factual settings? And this may be um, surprising to many of you, that you could still libel someone in your novel. Okay, um, and there, there was a case here, Smith v. Stewart, and this was really at the summary judgment stage, and the court was determining whether or not it had to go to a jury. Okay, so essentially, the author wrote um, her character based on this individual. And there were many similarities. There were also many differences between them. But because there were so many similarities, the court concluded... Um, and, and differences that they concluded that it was a jury issue to determine whether the character was a portrayal of that person. So just be careful in terms of who you're basing your characters on um, and what you're um, what you're writing. So you can still be liable even though um, you're running enough. You can't just say, oh, it's fiction. I'm protected. That's not the case. Um, so, okay, those are the, the first couple elements. Then the statement, of course, has to harm the plaintiff's reputation. There's something more than just being offended or insulted. For example, you call someone arrogant. That's 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 not enough. Um, uh, however, you know there are some examples that you know would be potentially libelous. You expose a person to hatred, ridicule, contempt. You injure a person in their business or trade. And you lower a person in the esteem of one's peers. The classic law school example, of course, that someone has a loathsome. Uh, uh, disease. And there are also things that are potentially called the libel per se, where you don't really have to prove things. So if you are claiming that somebody committed a crime when they didn't, for example, um, they may not have to uh, uh, prove anything. And the interesting thing about libel, and we'll get into this with the right of privacy, is that the false light aspect of right of privacy is essentially this, very similar to the analysis that you do here for, for libel. Um, and then, of course, the statement was published with some level a fault for public officials and figures, it's actual malice, and for private figures, it's negligence. Essentially, you just violated the duty of care. You were careless um, in in publishing your materials. Excuse me, in your 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 manuscripts. So that's why it's when you're dealing with private individuals. That's why you sort of really have to tread lightly in terms of what you write. And we'll get into the different things that you can do to to protect yourself. Okay, so let's just go into a few uh, cases here as to how you get the negligence standard and the actual malice standard. So I'm sure many of you have heard of the New York Times v. Sullivan case. So um, let's just go through it briefly here. So what what happened there? So the Times published an ad for contributing donations to defend Dr. King's, or excuse me, Dr. King on perjury charges. And the ad contained several minor factual inaccuracies. And Birmingham's public safety commissioner, L.B. Sullivan, felt that the criticism of his subordinates reflected poorly on him, even though he wasn't mentioned in the ad itself. Remember that of and concerning aspect of it? Uh, Sullivan asked the Times to retract the statement, but of course they refused. And Sullivan filed a lawsuit against the Times for libel in Alabama State Court. And the uh, Supreme Court determined um, that if a plaintiff in a defamation case is a public official or running for public office, and this actually later on in the case law um, also applied to public figures, and he or she must prove that the statement was made with actual malice, which means that the defendant knew the statement was false or recklessly disregarded whether it was true and published it anyway. It's much harder for public figures and public officials to win on a defamation case um, because of this actual malice standard. It's much easier for private individuals 
to sue because the standard is negligent. So where did that negligent standard come from? It comes from the Gertz case, uh, Gertz v. Robert Welch, and you know what, what happened there. So Gertz was an attorney hired by a family to sue a police officer who had killed the family's son. In a magazine called American Opinion, the John Birch Society accused him of being a Leninist and a communist fronter because he chose to represent clients who were suing a law enforcement officer. So the issue before the court was, that does the First Amendment allow a newspaper or broadcaster to assert defamatory, me, defamatory falsehoods about an individual who is neither a public official, official nor a public figure, essentially like you and me, right? Um, and they said that for private individuals, there could be no liability for defamation without some proof of fault. So they got rid of the strict liability that, you know, if you said something that was defamatory, boom, you, you don't have to prove anything. They said there has to be some proof of fault. And here they said that proof for private individuals has to be negligence. Okay, so there's you know private individuals, public individuals. Um, what about you know, def you know defenses here? Well, the truth, of course, is always a defense, but the question always becomes, how do you prove it? If it's just about you know experiences that you've had, you know people live life; they don't write everything down that happens to them, right? Uh, so it, it it sometimes gets difficult where it's sort of he said, she said type of thing. Um, then there's opinion, of course, but be careful. Um, so if you say Joe Perry is an alcoholic um, versus I think Joe Perry is an alcoholic. Just because you wrote the, wrote the words, I think it becomes an opinion, right? You're not off the hook. That can still be defamatory. Okay. And the question you have to ask, ask yourself when you're writing these opinions is can a reasonable reader understand this statement as a verifiable fact? Um, so of course, so there's truth opinion. And of course there are privileges. So there are um, some privileges that are absolute, some are qualified. An, ab an example of an absolute pr um, privilege is um, testimony during judicial proceedings, legislative debates. So if you're in Congress, you, you know, say something about somebody, you're not going to be um, you know, uh, uh, held to be uh, 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 libelous um, or really slander because you'd be speaking. And then there are qualified um, privileges like citizen testimony during legislative um, you know, proceedings, so like the January 6th uh, 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 testimony, for example. Um, and I also included this slide because I think it's very important just for you to know. It sort of gets into the weeds here in terms of defamation, but it's just important to know. So there's um, there are two rules. One is the single publication rule and one is the republication rule. And the single publication rule means that your publisher um, or you as a self-published author can only be sued for libel over the original publishing of your book, not the subsequent distribution or additional printings of the same book. So if you printed 5,000 copies, you're not going to be sued 5,000 times, of course. You're only going to be sued once. And then there's the republication rule, which you have to be very careful whether you're publishing somebody else's material or you're republishing your own. So repeating a defamatory falsehood is treated as the publisher of that falsehood and can be held liable to the same extent as the original publisher. And the other thing that happens with the republication rule is that the statute of limitations for a, de a defamation claim starts over. So for example, if you wrote a book and there was something defamatory in it, the statute of limitation begins. And then for example, let's just say you're in the middle of publicizing your book and you post something online, say three months later, uh, and that, that excerpt includes that defamatory material, the statute of limitations begins um, anew for that um, second publication. That's why I always tell authors, whether as an agent or as an, in, uh, as an attorney, just be careful in terms of what you're, you're publishing in terms of your, your excerpts, um, really any quotes on social media uh, specifically, um, really in, in any media, but of course, because we're in the social media age, um, definitely social media. Okay, so that's a libel. And then there's right of privacy, which um, you know is, is similar um, to a certain extent, however, you could be sued for violations of privacy, even if you've written something that's true about somebody. Um, that's the real big difference. Um, uh, the similarity, of course, is that it's also based on state law. Um, there are generally four types of, of rights of uh, uh, rights of privacy. There's the disclosure of private and embarrassing facts, um, false light, intrusion, and right of publicity. Um, this is sort of the, the intrusion one is sort of the one you think of with like you know, paparazzi, right? These two are the main ones that you're going to deal with as a writer. So um, you got to be careful that even if you wrote something that's true, you're disclosing private and embarrassing facts. Um, you know, for example, um, you're disclosing someone's sex life. Um, that may be something that that person does not want out there in the public. 
Okay, so if it's a public disclosure of those facts that they believe are highly offensive to a reasonable person and the disclosed facts aren't newsworthy, like, you know, who would care about that? Um, you might be on the hook for um, a violation of privacy. Um, and then also there's false light. Um, so, you know, information is published, your publication identifies the plaintiff and it places the plaintiff in a false light that's highly offensive to a reasonable reader. Um, so for example, if, you know, I was a doctor and you claim that I was a quack and all of my, um, methods harmed people. And that wasn't the case. That's an example of, of false light. Um, uh, uh, and then there's a uh, right of publicity, which is a form of, of right of privacy. And this is the name image likeness. Um, so, uh, uh, there, there are a few instances that you have to deal with right of privacy. Uh, uh, a key one is endorsements. So if, you know, you have a blurb by somebody, uh, you know, I don't know why anybody would do this, but if you just made up that somebody blurbed your book, um, that's a right of public, uh, assumed right of publicity, uh, violation. And sometimes, you know, for your book, depending on what you're writing, um, you know, you may need to get release forms for people to use their name, image, and likeness. I go through this all the time, you know, people interview, uh, subjects, um, and, uh, uh, sometimes it's best to get a release form, um, not only to use the name, image, and likeness, but also to release yourself from any um, you know, liability that they may have, or any claim that they have to a copyright, or any claim that they, you know, say like, "Oh, you wrote a book. Um, you know, I'm gonna, you know, get five percent of the the, the profits." Um, so it's just a, a sort of a, a catch-all type of form that um, uh, uh, can help you uh, get rid of all those those nasty things that, you know, people can come back, uh, about your book, uh, uh, to me about your book. Um, so anyway, um, that's right of privacy. Um, okay. So the last part of this is trademarks. Okay. Uh, so what is a trademark? So it's a general word, phrase, symbol, or design, or it's a combination of that. And it identifies and distinguishes the source of the goods of one party from another. That's really the key here, that it distinguishes the source of goods. Um, what trademark law does is that it makes us better consumers. Imagine you went to a store and there were no brand names anywhere, say it was a shoe store. You'd have no idea what shoe to buy, what was quality, what wasn't. Um, it makes us better consumers, makes us better, more efficient consumers because the minute you see a logo, you automatically associate high quality with it. That's why um, advertisers put so much, um, or really companies put so much goodwill into their um uh, uh, trademarks and advertise them because they want you to associate high quality, good quality with their their products and services. And of course, you know, you know what are examples of trademarks like the Nike Swoosh, McDonald's Golden Arch? Just think of any famous uh, uh, logo. So, what's the difference between copyrights and trademarks? Uh, well, copyright, as we know, protects original works of authorship, and trademarks protect brand names and logos used on goods and services. So, if you're, um, you know wanting to start a company and you want to you know choose a trademark i thought i would just include this here because i think it's just it's it's fascinating um there are things that you can use uh, words that you can use that actually aren't protected so um let's go from the the top down okay so the first three here if you're trying to choose a trademark uh, this is really what you want to go after okay so the first one is called a fanciful mark and this is essentially a mark that has been invented for the sole purpose of functioning as a trademark uh, there's no other meaning uh, there's no other purpose to the word. For example, Exxon, it's a made up word, but it was for the purpose of trademark. Those are the most uh, protected. Underneath that is arbitrary marks. And those are marks that have a common meaning, but there's no relation to the goods or service. So for example, Apple, we all know what Apple is, but it's for computers. So you can see how it's an arbitrary mark. Then there are suggestive marks, which suggest a quality or characteristic of the goods or services. For example, Microsoft, sort of like an aha moment like Microsoft. You're suggesting software for microchips. You know, sometimes you just never think of like why companies are, are named the way, they, the way they are. It's like, ah, I see what you're doing there. And then there are descriptive marks, um, which aren't uh, protected uh, nearly as much as the first three. And they essentially just describe the goods or the services. To get protection, you need what is called secondary meaning. We're going to go for this um, you know, in, in, in the next slide. And then underneath that are generic marks, which are marks that were originally um, uh, a trademark, but they essentially become synonymous with the product um, and they become generic. So for example, Kleenex, Band-Aid, uh, it's not listed here, like Velcro. That was once 
you know, a product. And now it's synonymous with the the name. So once that happens, you lose your your trademark protection. So that's why a lot of companies try to make sure that that doesn't happen to them. Um, so, okay, that's trademarks in general. So how does this apply to you in book publishing? Um, well, trademarks, um, they could be a book series, for example, Harry Potter. Um, generally speaking, you can't trademark a single title. Um, the exception to uh, that rule would be like a famous title, for example, like Gone with the Wind. Uh, you can also trademark characters and an author's name. However, there, you know, uh, at least, and I'm not a trademark attorney, I'm, I'm copyright in, 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 you know, First Amendment. Um, uh, there's really an argument here that, you know, you you could, you know, trademark your your name, but um, you really have to try to get, you know, secondary meaning. Like, it'd be hard for me. My name's Joe Perry. I share the same name of the, the guitarist, Samir uh, I think it'd be really hard for me to trademark it because, uh, you know, essentially you want uh, someone to associate you in order to get the trademark, associate the source. You are the source of your product. You're the source of your book. You are the author of your book. Um, if there are a million Joe Perry's out there that have filed for the trademark, it, it, I think it might be hard for me to distinguish that, uh, distinguish myself from from, from the pack. Um, so it's, it, it, it can be difficult. The good thing about, you know, characters, of course, is that, you know, if you're illustrating them, they, of course, can be copyrighted. You can register them at the, uh, the copyright office. So that could be a way to, um, you know, protect yourself. Um, so, uh, you know, what do you need to consider when you're actually using trademarks in your book? Well, you got to make sure that you're not disparaging a product, which is essentially libel, but for businesses, i.e. trade libel, um, essentially making sure that you're not saying that somebody's product harms somebody, maims somebody, kills somebody. Um, and there's trademark blurring. Um, so like trademarks get their value because of their uniqueness. So for example, he like said that like Nike's in your book, you know, Nike was, um, you know, now uh, uh, creating silverware. <laughs> That's going to be a, a form of uh, potential trademark infringement. And then there's trademark tarnishment, which deals with you know, courts with unsavory things like drugs, alcohol, sex. Um, the famous case is... Um, uh, uh, the Dallas Cowboys successfully sued the Debbie Does Dallas Adult Filmmakers um, because they felt that it tarnished their their trademark. Then there's nominative fair use, which I think is really the question that everyone asks. Can I use this brand in my my book? And for most people, the answer is yes. Um, but you have to sort of pass this test. Um, and this gets you know a little bit of legal ease here, but I'll distill it down for you as best I can. So let's just go through the three three of them really quick. So the product or the service cannot be readily identified without using the trademark. So you can't really say it in any other way, right? The user only uses as much of the mark as is necessary to identify it. So the words, but not the font or the symbol. So for example, if you wrote a book about the Beatles, you're not using the Beatles font or the trademark in your book. You're just, you know, in time to New Roman, you know, write Beatles. And the user does nothing to suggest sponsorship or endorsement by the trademark holder. So that's really the big key here. You want to make sure that the, the reader doesn't think that because you use this brand name that there's no suggestion of sponsorship or endorsement. So for example, um, you know, if you said, you know, my character, you know, you wrote a novel, my character is wearing Nike shoes or my character ate a Burger King. That's, that's totally fine. Um, you know, the, how do you, how else do you say Burger King? How else do you say Nike? You're only using the mark as much as is necessary, not using the font um, or the specific, you know, symbol. Um, and you're not suggesting any sponsorship or, or endorsement. And that's essentially what happened here in this famous case, the new kids on the block. Um, what happened there was that there was a survey in two papers and then um, the survey asked which new kids on the block member the public liked the most. The new kids on the block saw the survey and said, hey, you can't put her name in that survey. Um, you know, that's trademarked. And the court essentially said, yes, they can. That's, you know, how else are they going to say it? And then B, they didn't use the um, the trademark itself and there wasn't any sponsorship or or endorsement so i think of it this way like you know if you're writing about sports or really whatever you know whatever it is you're writing about um you know let's just take sports for example the chicago bulls won you know the, the championship it's, you need to say that other than uh you know the basketball team from chicago um you know it, it just it, it doesn't make sense to make authors do that so that's why the court has this rule that you know you're allowed to use brain names. you just want to make sure that there's no sponsorship and you're not um or endorsement and that you're not using the actual trademark you know itself no using it as much as is needed uh for your purpose okay so that's intellectual property um uh, christine what time do we have I just want to make sure how fast I can. Um, we're 12.50 right now, and we're going till 1.30, right. and hopefully um, some Man, good time for q and so Definitely awesome. giving me some time here. Enough awesome. time. All right, I flew through that quicker than I thought. Okay. 
Um, okay, so part two is book contracts. So I'm gonna go through um, the first two slides, uh, typical agent agreement, collaboration agreement, and then your traditional book publishing agreement. So um, I'm an agent myself. I draft my agreements for all my um, my, my clients. As a lawyer, I've reviewed agent agreements. Um, and you know, generally, these are the things that you will see. Um, you know, agent compensation, you're gonna get 15% commission for any domestic sales or any sub rights, uh, but that, that actually could be 20%. It also depends if you're co-agent yourself. Um, then there's foreign sales, 20%. That can also get up to 25%. That can also be split, sometimes broken down by, by territory. Um, and then some uh, agents will want you for your entire career. Others will want it for your single work. I like it just for the single work, just because it makes it easy for me to get out of the contract. If A, I don't sell the work, or B, uh, we both realize that the relationship isn't what we thought it would be. Um, so just on my end and for my author's end, I just think it's fair to do it that way. And then there are collaboration agreements. And I urge every single one of you, if you're going to collaborate with somebody, to get an agreement um, uh, drafted before you do anything. Um, and these are the things that you want to um, uh, put in there. Uh, A, who's writing what, who's drafting what, who's illustrating what, um, whether that's a proposal. If you're writing a nonfiction book, you're going to have to write the proposal, then you're going to have to write the book itself. So who's writing what chapters, what features, of, not features, what chapters, what parts of the book proposal, who's writing the chapters of the book, um, you know, who's illustrating, who's writing it, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, compensation. Usually it's 50-50. I've seen a ton of different... Um, uh, compensation packages. Uh, some people will forego, um, you know, an upfront fee and they'll want royalties at the end. So others just want a straight up 50, 50. Um, then, you know, the other thing is of course, who's going to approve this? Who's going to have a final approval, um, of your book proposal and your manuscript? What if you come to, you know, an impasse and you're like, you know, neither one of you agree on, on how to move forward. So what I try to do is just, um, bring in third parties to do that. So if you have an agent, like I'm the one who determines the final approval, um, or if you're at the, uh, 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 if you already have a contract and you're you're writing the book itself, the editor, the publisher will have final approval. Then of course there's credit um, order, and this actually can be a very um, uh, uh, conflicting <laughs> aspect of the collaboration. You wouldn't think so, but it is. I actually dealt with this as as an agent uh, where uh, my authors were arguing for months whether or not to put the word and or with in between the two of their names. Uh, so it really does matter. So the order of the names, the size, how it's going to appear on the cover, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then, of course, what happens if one of you can't write it or illustrate it, and God forbid, if anything ever happens to you, you can disable, pass away, how are royalties handled? Um, who's going to handle the approval? Um, you know, how is your estate going to um, uh, uh, handle things um, or the other person's you know, estate? So these are some things to, to think about, but I highly, highly, highly recommend getting a collaboration agreement. Um, okay, so now let's go forward to the um, traditional agreement. So, then, uh, so the the big one uh, that every it's the first usually ninety nine point nine percent of contracts. The first provision you will see are the grant of rights. Um, it's usually either a license or an assignment. Um, you want to make sure that you are licensing your work. You are not assigning your work. If you assign your work, the copyright to your work, that is, you forgo ownership. You no longer own it. You can't do anything with it. The publisher will own it, and they can do whatever they want with it. However, there are exceptions to that, at least in my opinion. Um, if you are an academic and you're publishing um, for tenure purposes and you don't care what they do with your book, you just want to you know, say that you publish with Yale University Press or Harvard University Press, who cares if they do with it? Um, you, know, you, may, you, know, you, you may not care. That's why a lot of academic presses have an assignment clause on there. And there are traditional uh, trade publishers that have assignment clauses in there, but I always change it to an exclusive license. Um, uh, and then... Uh, subsumed under a license are these three things. We're going to get into, I'm not going to talk about um, territory and language just yet, but just generally speaking, you know, there are different territories throughout the world. And then of course, different languages throughout the world. Um, uh, but the, you know, the big thing that I want to talk about here is exclusive versus non-exclusive. 99.9, really not, not even 99, hundred percent of the time, it will be an exclusive license. It will never be a non-exclusive license. Um, an exclusive license means you are licensing your copyright to that one publisher. Um, a non-exclusive license would mean you're licensed to get to multiple publishers and no publisher is gonna want a non-exclusive license. They're always gonna want an exclusive license. Um, and this is what a sample clause looks like. Um, the author, you know, some of these clauses that I have in here are really long, so I'm not gonna read all of them for the ones that are shorter, I'm going to do that. So 
just so you can get a sense of what it means here. The author hereby grants and assigns to the publisher for the full term of the copyright and renewals or extensions thereof, the sole and exclusive right to print, publish, promote, advertise, distribute, transmit, and sell the work in whole or in part in English language and all other languages throughout the world. This is the language part and the territory part. And we'll get into that once we talk about the subrights aspect of this. And to exercise or authorize the exercise of any of the other rights in any other form as provided here. Yeah. Okay, so that's the grant of rights. So of course you wanna make sure you have a, a license if you can. Then the, uh, uh, the big thing, of course, everyone's always going to be concerned about are you know, royalties. We'll get into advances in a little bit here. But generally speaking, there are um, standards for different um, types of books. So hardcover is usually 10 to 15%. Paperback is 7.5 to 12%. And mass market paperback, that's you know books you see in airports, newsstands, that's usually 7 to 10%. No, uh, just real. Wanted... I'm I'm so sorry to interrupt. Is that just for traditional books and not hybrid published yes. books? Okay. Yes. Well, I'm gonna get into hybrid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right on. Thanks. Yep. Yep. Uh, what you want to do for all these um, is escalate them. Most publishers will escalate hardcover. Some of them don't escalate paperback. But you essentially want to say, okay, if you're going to start at 10, percent well, we're only going to do 10 percent for the first 5,000 copies. Then 12 and a half uh, until you sold 10,000, and then 15 percent thereafter. And then paperback, you do the same thing, 7.5, 10%, then 12%. Um, and then some more royalty basics here. Ebooks are usually 20 to 25. Um, audio, 25. Revised editions are usually half the regular royalty, but we'll get into this because sometimes there can also just be a fee that you're, you're getting paid. So it really just depends on uh, the publisher and the contract that you're signing. Um, and of course, there are bonuses. You know, if you think you're... It, 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 it's hard to get a best-selling bonus if you're a, a debut author because you know, they don't they don't believe you'll you'll get on the list unless you know you're a celebrity. Uh, but that's essentially what the language would look like. That you know you would they would pay you a certain amount each week. Your work appears on one of those lists for a certain amount of weeks. Uh, the other things that you could put in there are uh, you would get bonuses if you earn out your advance or if you um, meet a certain sales threshold. Say you sell ten thousand copies in the first year or five thousand copies, um, that they'll, they'll give you a, a flat fee. And then, of course, there are list royalties uh, and net royalties. And all the royalties that we spoke about before, those numbers are essentially all based on net. That's like 100% of publishers these days. List is, of course, the retail price of the book, but net is the net amount flowing to the publisher. This is what a net receipts definition looks like. Any money is received by publisher from the sale of copies of the work, minus reasonable reserves, and we're going to get into what reasonable reserve of returns means, or deductions for returns, after distrib distribution fees, co agent fees, shipping, customs, insurance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so essentially all these different expenses, everything that's left over, that's gonna go uh, uh, to you if you've earned out um, you know, your advance. Then there are deep discounts. Um, that's where your book is sold at like 55 to 60%. I'm sure you've seen it at bookstores, you know, at Barnes and Noble, you know, here's this book for you know, 70, 80% off. Um, and deep discounts are used to be primarily for special sales, for example, airports, newsstands, and the list price royalty would turn into a net royalty here. So once upon a time, it was based on list, and then a deep discount would turn into a net. Now publishers are selling books at higher discounts more frequently. So um, I just wanted to show you sort of the math breakdown between list and net here. So let's just go through the provision. On copies of the work sold by publisher at a discount of greater than 55%, um, the author will be paid a royalty of 15% of the publisher's net proceeds. So let's do, you know, if it's greater than 55, so let's just pretend it's at 55%. It's just gonna be the list price, right? So the list price is $10. The publisher receives 450, you receive $1.50, okay, 15% um, uh, uh, of, of the 10%, or sorry, $10. Um, if it's 56, this is when this provision kicks in. The list price, $10, the publisher receives 440 a copy, not 450, and you receive 66 cents. Um, instead of your dollar fifty, the 15% royalty of the publisher's share. Now this is based on net. So what can you do to fix this? You can specify the discount only applies to print on paper books outside of normal retail trade channels. Remember I said once upon a time, this only applied to special sales. So you may want to try to do the same thing. You can also request to change the percentage. So for example, a provision has a hardcover paperback discount starting at 58 or 55%. If it has that, you could ask so if the deep discount will apply instead of at 48%, it will apply to 51%. Or um, 55, um, it'll actually uh, uh, apply to 60% or more. Or you can ask for the same escalation clause as you negotiated for regular retail sales. Now, you can put all this in here and this, the publisher still may say no. 
<laughs> it all depends on the publisher. I've been through so many negotiations where some publishers are very, very willing to work with their authors, while others, most of it seems like a take it or leave it type of uh, uh, scenario, unfortunately. Um, and this is where I was going to get into to hybrid deals here. So there are also alternatives to traditional deals. Um, there's profit share. I've had many authors do this where you get 50-50. Some have um, their progressive profit shares where after a certain sales threshold, you get 60-40 or 70-30. Some uh, publishers who really like their authors may give them an advance on top of a profit share. Or you have you know, hybrid uh, uh, presses, which is essentially the reverse of this, which is you're going to be you know paying to play. Um, and of course, they're self-publishing as well. But since we were just talking about hybrid, you know, the pros of being uh, you know, with the hybrid are that you get higher royalties. Instead of that 10 to 15% for a hardcover, you might get 60 to 80%. Um, and the other pro is that the publisher produces and distributes your book. The con, of course, is that it's expensive and some of them are vanity presses. Uh, recently, I had um, an author um, almost sign a contract for $100,000 <laughs> to get their book published. Uh, it was absolutely insane. Um, so I've seen very, very high numbers. And um, of course, the for self-publishing, the excuse me, the royalties are of course the, the the same pro as hybrid. But the con, of course, is that you do everything. You have to distribute, publicize, you have to market the work. So that's why hybrid becomes um, a um, it becomes uh, interesting for for authors because you know <clears throat> traditional publish excuse me, traditional publishing is really hard. It's really hard to get an agent. It's really hard to get your book published. Um, so uh, this is sort of like an in-between, um, you know, between self-publishing and traditionally publishing. So that's why some authors may, may want to go with this. They don't want to do all the work. They want to write their book and, and, and get it published. Just, you know, if you are going to go that route, and I always suggest this, you know, A, make sure that you have some refund language in there that in case you don't like what they're doing, you can get your money back and you know, get your rights reverted. But even before you get to that point, ask them about their best, you know, books. How many copies have they sold? It's like a thousand or five hundred. You know, you might want to look elsewhere if they're getting their books, um, you know, reviewed um, by major publications like a traditional publisher. That's that's great to hear. So you want to just do your due diligence to make sure that your book is going to get the um, uh, uh, sort of love that you know you want it to get from a publicity and marketing standpoint. Um, so that a you can earn back the the amount that you paid, um, and then. Use it as, you know, really, you know, for a lot of people, they do this for passive income. It might be a, a CEO who's written a business book and, you know, they're going to go to signings and um, you know, uh, uh, sell it that way. So it's it's all context dependent. But I, I just say that as, you know, there are other methods to get published besides traditionally um, uh, publishing. Okay, so back to the contract. Um, uh, let's go through subreddits. So the main things that people care about, of course, are, um, you know, the rights, royalties, um, the sub rights. Um, sub rights, well, I essentially look at it like the royalties are sort of like primary rights, right? That's the royalty for actually publishing the book. Here are all the other extras that you can get. So um, here's book clubs. So usually it's a 50 50, but most sub rights are split between the um, author and the publisher. It just depending on the right, um, the percentage can change. So uh, it's 50 50 split. For book clubs, sometimes you can negotiate a bonus if you're featured in a prominent book club. However, book club memberships are declining. I know there are very, very famous ones out there, um, but getting into one is very unlikely. Um, so you know, this you may just say, okay, with the you know a 50-50 you know, split. Then there are mass market paperbacks. And again, it's usually 50-50. However, you may be able to get 60-40, 60 to you, 40 to the publisher. Um, you may be able to get consultation with negotiations, perhaps a right of approval over those terms. Um, you know, publishers want to delay licensing a lot of times until they see the hardcover sales soften. Given that there's a higher profit margin for hardcover, like excuse me, of course they they cost more to make and they um, you know they they uh, sell them at higher prices. Um, and what you might want to do is ask a publisher that has its own big mass marketplace line um, to negotiate a higher advance in the very beginning, because you know usually what happens is that okay we're going to publish the hardcover and then we'll license out the mass market elsewhere. But if they already have the capability to do that. Um, rather than go somewhere that may license it out to someone, you can say, oh, you have the capability of doing this. If you're going to do both of these, give me more money up front. Um, then, of course, there are foreign rights. Um, and, uh, I mentioned I was going to talk about some territories and languages um, uh, when we were talking about the grant of rights. Um, so as an author, um, your agent, you know, if I was your agent, I can go through a foreign rights agent to license 
these rights. And I go through my, you know, my foreign, I just had a conversation with her, with her yesterday. And essentially the foreign rights agent acts as a middle person to um, all the different territories. So essentially um, your, the money that you get uh, essentially is after the um, uh, commissions. So what happens is that I'll go to my foreign rights agent and say, hey, I have this book that I think it'll sell in X, Y, or Z territory, I don't know, France, uh, Japan. Um, they'll then contact the co-agents in those territories and they try to get it published. If it does get published, instead of my 20% commission, it would get split in half, 10 and 10. Uh, 10 to me, 10 to the co-agent, and then the foreign rights agent would also take another five. Then you would get sort of what's left, so 75%. If you don't have, if your agent doesn't have a foreign rights agent, or you think that the publisher is good enough to distribute um, world rights, for example, if you're at a big five, um, uh, or um, you know a, a bigger independent press that you think they'll, they'll, they'll do a good job of it, um, or your foreign rights agent may say, I don't think this is going to sell, um, just give them you know world rights. Um, it's it, it, the money that you get is less than what you would in this scenario. And that's because um, you have the commissions, you still have these commissions, but you also have the split between you and the publisher. Up here, you didn't have that split, right? Because you retained it. You went through your foreign rights agent. If you grant it to the publisher, you will split that on top of the commission. So that 25% on top of an 80% to you, 20% to the publisher in the UK, for example, or 75, 25 to other you know, territories. Okay. And agents, um, they should at least ask for a reversion of these rights if they're not licensed after a certain amount of years. This goes to any rights, right? If they're not doing anything with it, they don't have any plans to do anything with it, you should put some language in there that reverts the, the, the rights to you after a certain amount of years. Um, uh, and before I mention, you know, territory. So these are the territories within publishing. There's North America, um, in languages, North American English, okay, that's the US, its territories, Canada, and the Philippines. Then there's world English, which is UK Commonwealth, uh, excuse me, the UK Commonwealth countries or former Commonwealth countries like Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, sometimes India. Then there's rest of world, of course, obviously that's that's all languages. UK is usually split 80-20. Rest of the world is usually split 75-25. However, what publishers are doing now is that they're just saying, we're just going to split everything down the middle, every single sub right. Um, uh, 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 50 50. Some of them don't want to um, uh, negotiate right by right. So they're just saying, here's 50 50. We'll, you know, we'll split it with you down the middle. Um, okay. Uh, the next right um, uh, for serial rights is, specifically for sub rights, is serial rights. And these are excerpts of your, your book. Um, it's, I think, becoming progressively harder to get paid for this. A lot of uh, places will excerpt your book, but they won't do it for a fee. They'll do it for free. But if they do do it for a fee, um, you should get 90% to you and then 10% to the publisher for first serial. And that's before publication. So if you have an excerpt in the New Yorker a week before your book publishes, you should get 90%. If it was after publication, um, then you should get 50-50. Um, that's called second serial rights. Then there are dramatic film, TV, radio, and podcasts. Um, usually, um, I, I try, most agents, I try to retain these rights, uh, especially for uh, film, TV, um, dramatic rights, radio, and uh, uh, podcasts. Um, you know, for film and TV, what happens is that um, I will go to a, a film agent or sometimes uh, producers will reach out to me um, and say, hey, uh, I think uh, your you know client's book would make a good film you know, or, or um, TV show. Uh, whatever it may be, um, and we enter into an option agreement and they have a certain amount of uh, time to sell your work to studios. Of course, everything is on hold now with the writer's strike. Um, uh, uh, so that's, you know, film and TV. Um, however, you know, podcasts are interesting because that's really how a lot of people are discovering really everything these days, right? Um, so publishers are becoming smarter <laughs> and they're beginning to push their own podcasts. So they may not actually grant these to you. Um, so you really want to try to retain them, you know, as much as possible, especially if you plan on um, creating your own podcast. If you don't, and you're just going to go on other people's podcasts, it may not you know, matter to you. Again, everything is context dependent, book dependent. Um, then there are audiobooks. Um, usually that's split 50-50, you know, with the publisher. Um, of course, the agent will try to retain these as well. Um, however, get on the last bullet point here, many deals now are contingent on the publisher retaining 
audio rights. Okay, so you may not get that. And uh, as an agent, I want to try to retain that because it's it can be very lucrative. Some books, you know, you may just get you know, a couple thousand dollars, but hey, that's better than nothing, right? Um, uh, but if if you don't um, retain those and you give them to the, the publisher, you're going to split that, um, you know, that advance 50-50 you know, with the publisher. And the advance is usually half on signing and then half on publication. However, which I think is really interesting, especially for those who are writing memoirs, you can ask to narrate the book. Of course, you have to audition. What you need to do is, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, you have to give a, um, I don't know, two to three minute recording. That's usually what my clients have done. Um, and they you know, read the book, they send it in. And if it's if they think it's good enough, you know, you can narrate it. It makes sense if you're writing, you know, a memoir. It should be your own story, right? But if you don't want to do that, then what they do is they hire professionals to, to narrate the book for you. Usually the audiobook is published simultaneously with the hardcover. And then there's merchandising. Usually that's a 50-50 split. Um, of course, this deals, you know, with you know, licensing of characters and deals a lot with, you know, fiction, toys, posters, calendars, games, et cetera, et cetera. And this is where it really highlights the value of a publisher's trademark, right? And this is why publishers always want to try to get as many of the big um, you know, brands that they can, you know, especially for kids, Harry Potter, Daniel Tiger, Peppa Pig, all that stuff. Uh, and like I said, it's prevalent in children's but and in fiction. Um, now, I, I should say, if you're planning on creating your own merchandise, you may want to try to retain that as well. You can, uh, you know, if you're trying, if you're going to create t-shirts, you're going to create hats, uh, you know, whatever it may be, um, you know, on your website, mugs, um, you know, <laughs> whatever it is, you may want to try to um, you know, retain those for yourself. Um, okay, so that's royalty sub rights. Um, and then there's... Um, there are instances where you're not going to get a royalty, okay? And that's for any copies that are lost or destroyed, um, any copies that are sold at or below the manufacturing cost, free copies, um, any copies of the work or a derivative work um, that are essentially furnished by the publisher for publicity purposes, um, any not-for-profit publication of the work or a derivative work in Braille or special editions for the print statement. So there are a few instances here where you will not receive a royalty. Then there are um, uh, offer copies, okay? and there are two parts to this. Um, one is the free copies that you're going to get. Usually it's like five to 50. Um, the other part is the copies that you would buy um, in addition to those free copies. Okay, so this first provision here, this deals with the, the free copies aspect. And, and here the author gets 20 free copies and the agent gets five free copies. Um, any copies that you are going to purchase, um, that's usually the second part of this provision. And most of the time, it's 40 to 50% um, uh, discount. And in this particular provision, they actually um, listed out here that it'd be 40% for one to 24 copies and then 50% for 25 copies or more. Um, uh, so what's, what's interesting is that a lot of times those copies that you buy may not count toward your royalties. However, um, they may count towards pre-orders if you're traditionally published. Um, and the it, it, and if, even though they may not count as royalties, what you usually do um, is that you buy it at a discount, and then you go to a book signing, and then you sell the book at the um, the, the list price so that you get your money back, um, uh, or you can sell it at whatever price you want. You can mark it up. You know, you do whatever you want, but you likely won't be able to get royalties from this. Um, oh, and then also just know there's a thing in publishing that's happening more and more lately. It's called buybacks. Um, that essentially the publisher is not um, offering you an advance, um, but they're offering you a buyback, which essentially means that you need to purchase, if you purchase X amount of copies, we'll publish your book. Um, it depends on your financial situation. That can be very, very, very expensive. And they may say you need to publish two, excuse me, um, purchase 2,000 copies, 5,000 copies, 1,000 copies, you know, whatever it may be. Um, so uh, it's just a way to get yourself in the hole, <laughs> in my opinion. But if you have the means for it and you think you have an audience where you'll be able to, you know, uh, uh, sell way more copies than what you're initially purchasing, by all means, that might be a way to, to go. Uh, next, we're going to get into accounting. Okay, usually statements are semi-annual. So uh, this month, we're actually going to get some royalty statements at the end of the month. So usually the um, uh, periods are 
ending June 30th and December 31st. So you usually get paid um, the end of September and the, the end of March. There are some publishers who do this quarterly, which is great because authors, of course, always want to know how their book is doing. So uh, in addition to those two periods, you'll also get paid in um, June. So June, uh, September, December, and March. So every you know, couple months. Um, and you know, I say all this uh, uh, you know, with, with quarterly, it's great. But you know, I mentioned these accounting, um, uh, 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 excuse me, the, the the accounting practices and the royalty statements because you know you can always ask the, the publisher how your your book is doing. Like, hey, how many books have I sold? It's not that you have to wait to get your statement to find out. Um, and then al also there are um, publishers who just have an annual uh, 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 accounting statement. It's usually, that's smaller publishers or university presses. Sometimes sometimes publishers don't have the bandwidth to um, give royalty statements every six months, so they just do it once once a year. Um, and then there are reserve against returns, which I had mentioned before we were going to talk about. So um, reserve against return. Okay, so essentially that's a, uh, uh, an accounting practice. It's very unique to book publishing. Book publishing is based on consignment. It's, I mean, it's, in an, it's a consignment industry. So every book that the bookstore buys, they may not sell. So the book publisher knows that and they bake that into their accounting. So they put a reserve for those returns that they're going to get back into their accounting. Okay. And usually they say this um, reserve, they will say publisher may retain a reasonable reserve against returns. And the reason why they say that is because well, I, don't, I don't know how it's going to sell. How do we know that number of what, you know, what it's going to be? What I try to do is cap it. So instead of a reasonable reserve against returns, I try to cap it at 25%, 35%. Um, and what happens is that as your book sells and as you earn out your advance, once you get to, you know, earning royalties, at some point, with after the first few accounting periods, that money should liquidate. It should go to you um, rather than the publisher holding that amount. Okay, so that's reserve. Um, and now uh, we're going to talk about auditing. Okay, so if you think uh, a publisher has you know not paid you uh, properly, you could hire a CPA to audit them. Uh, and if uh, what they find um, is you know an, 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 with you know, five percent or more of an error then the publisher will take on the cost of the audit rather than um, having you uh, uh, pay for it. Um, however, what you need to know is that if you think they've done you wrong, you need to act quickly. A lot of times um, you only have a year or two to um, object to any uh, uh, royalty statements. Okay, so that's auditing. Uh, then there's copyright registration. Uh, essentially, the publisher should um, I've been in instances, I've seen instances where publishers say they will not do this, but every publisher should do this for their authors, essentially register the copyright in, in your name. You don't have to do anything. You know, maybe you need to, you know, fill out some documents for them, but you don't have to go through the registration process. Then there's publicity. Uh, essentially, you're going to be um, giving your best, you know, efforts to, you know, publicize and market the book. Um, they're going to be using your name, image, and likeness and biography in connection with, you know, marketing and publicizing the, the work. So what I try to do is try to get a pre-approved name, image, and likeness. So you, know, you can choose what it is, um, specifically your picture <laughs> of what they can include um, in their, their marketing materials, their uh, publishing materials. Um, and, you know, you just want to, you know, make sure when you're looking at this provision that uh, they're not going overboard. Uh, in terms of what they're demanding of you, uh, you know, especially just given what we've all been through with the pandemic. Um, and uh, they actually, you know, at least some publishers have understood this and they have said that, you know, if you're not able to um, attend certain events because of public health requirements, um, that that won't be a breach of contract. You just want to make sure in this contract, or sorry, this provision of the contract, that, you, that they're not requiring you to do you know, a certain amount of events or a certain amount of signings. Um, you know, I guess it all depends, right? If they're asking you to do one or two of them, that's that's fine. But if they're, you know, they're making it up 10 to 15, if you can't do that, then, you know, you should definitely flag them and, you know, talk to them and maybe make it make the language a bit, a bit more general. And then there's representations and warranties. I want every one of you to pay attention to this. <laughs> Outside of um, the money that you're all going to get for your books, this and the identification clause are... Uh, and the grant of rights. This is the most important provision that you need to understand um, in the identification one, which is, even though it's the one you need to know, it's the, probably the most confusing. <laughs> uh, but I will try to go through um, through them and distill it down for you. So let's step back, uh, sort of, what's a representation? 
Representation is a statement of fact. And a warranty is a promise that this representation will remain true into the future. They, and this is standard in every contract. They have a laundry list of representations and warranties here. And they put all of the risk on you to essentially make sure your work isn't libelous. It doesn't commit copyright infringement. It doesn't commit trademark infringement, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm just going to go through all of these just so you can get a sense of what they're asking you. Okay. Or the requiring of you, I should say. So they're requiring you to represent and warrant that you are the sole author of the work, which seems, you know, easy enough. Uh, two, that um, you are, the author is the sole owner of all rights granted here under. Um, so you're the, not only the sole author of the work, but you're the sole author of all the, owner of all the rights granted. And there's nothing um, that you've sold, licensed, assigned, or otherwise encumbered um, to other parties about this book, that you won't sell, license, or assign you know, any of those rights. Then you have the power to enter into this agreement. Are there any agreements that would prevent you from entering into this agreement? You need to know about that, if there are. Number five, or, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, five. Uh, the work is original. Remember, we spoke about that. You mean all know. We all know now what an original work is. Um, it's it's unpublished and it's not in the public domain. Um, and then it doesn't violate copyright law. It doesn't um, uh, violate any proprietary rights. So, for example, if you've written a business book, you don't want to include um, proprietary data from a company. For example, um, it doesn't violate any contract or personal rights, which essentially means the right of privacy, um, or it's not otherwise um, libelous. This thing here contains nothing unlawful. That's very, very general. Um, so I try when I see language like that, I try to strike it. Um, and then lastly, there's um, a language here that says that you're gonna represent and warrant that no recipe, formula, or instruction contained in the work is injurious to the user if used. And the reason why the publisher has put this risk back on you, specifically for number seven, is that once upon a time, unfortunately, the how-to books and the cookbooks um, you know, injured somebody, they named somebody. So the publisher said, I'm not taking on that risk. I'm going to put it on the author. Um, so you got to make sure that you know, if you are writing things that are instructional, you know, there's you know, formulas, there's recipes that you are doing your due diligence. Uh, and the reason why this is so important, you can see that the warranties they're going to survive the termination of this agreement. So what can you do here to protect yourself? Like I said before here, the, when it's very, very general, I try to strike it. You know, it contains nothing unlawful. Well, what does that even mean, right? That, that could potentially bring up laws in the U.S. and, you know, all throughout the world. What I try to do here is that I say the author, to the best of the author's knowledge, represents and warrants all of these things. It sort of qualifies the language. Now, it depends on the publisher. Some publishers are okay with that. Some are not. And that's because they say, well, if you put that language in there, it sort of takes the teeth out of all these representations and warranties. Why are we doing them in the first place? Mm -hmm. So, but I try to do that. And some publishers are, are okay with it. And the reason why this is very um, you know, important is because if you violate any of these representations and warranties, it triggers an indemnification clause. So what is an indemnification clause? Essentially, it means that you're compensating someone for a harm or a loss. So let's just say, let's you know, pretend that you um, are, or the publisher is sued for copyright infringement because of the fact that you violate it. You, since you violated this, you're getting sued for copyright infringement. It's gonna trigger this indemnification provision, which means you are going to indemnify the publisher for any losses that are incurred to that lawsuit. And then you also might pay legal costs. You might pay attorney's fees, okay? I know that sounds very, very scary, uh, but that's essentially what all of this refers to. So that's why all the things I was talking about, you know, before with copyright, First Amendment, things to, to ways to protect yourself, it's all in here. Okay, it's all in the contract. So you want to make sure that you're doing your due diligence, getting the permissions that you need. Um, if you don't think something's going to be fair use, getting release forms from people who you may think, you know, may sue you. Um making sure your work doesn't libel somebody. That's why you want to have an attorney read those things. There's no right, right of privacy violation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I know that sounds you know, very, very scary, but you know these things you know, do happen. And the reason why it's so important, other than the fact, of course, that you can get sued, is that the indemnification clause is written for the publisher um, uh, in that all that needs to happen is that somebody brings a claim against you. Okay? Essentially, someone just files a lawsuit against you. 
that's when this provision gets triggered. And what happens is that your royalties get um, they get frozen until the the litigation is is finished. Um, and the the reason why I said it's important is because this is virtually non-negotiable. Unfortunately, there are certain things that you can do. Like, you know, you could say that, okay, if you're going to freeze my royalties, make sure it goes into an interest bearing account. Um, uh, you know, you could um, uh, make sure that the publisher doesn't settle, you know, without you. Make sure that the publisher is, you know, uh, looking at the lawsuit, making sure it's still active. And if it's not active or if you've won, that, that those royalties then will, will go, 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 go back to you. So, I bring all this up not to scare you, okay? Because I know that when I ever talk, when I talk to anybody about this, they're like, "Oh my God, I'm never going to write anything ever, <laughs> you know, ever again." Um, entering into a relationship with the publisher is a risk, and it's inherently a risk, right? You don't know how your book is going to do um, uh, uh, from a sales standpoint, and it's also a legal risk, right? Um, that you know, there always is the possibility of potentially you know getting sued. So there are things that you know you can do to protect yourself, um, you know. Have an attorney read your manuscript. Put in disclaimers where you need to. Get author's insurance. If you don't have it, get author's insurance. Look into it. Um, uh, it will protect you because what this does, um, uh, this identification clause, this, there's no sort of limit to your um, uh, liability. So if you have insurance, it'll at least cover some of that. You can also get an LLC, have things go through your LLC rather than through you individually. So it's really just you know, sort of um, trying to protect yourself as much as you can. But unfortunately, these provisions aren't um, really negotiable. So that's why you really need to do your due diligence in the very, very beginning um, when writing your book or in the middle, but not obviously not towards the end, but making sure that you've done all the things that you you need to do. And then, you know, it's essentially how much risk are you willing to take on, right? Um, from a copyright standpoint, if, you know, you're not getting permission for to use something or writing about somebody, um, like I had mentioned before, it's easier to get sued if you're writing about a private individual than a public individual, or excuse me, public figure, or public official. So anyway, I, I don't want to sound like I'm, I'm trying to scare every one of you, but I want you to understand this is what you're signing in a book contract. This isn't every book contract. Um, so uh, anyway, that's 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 uh, uh, the scary representation of warranties and, and indemnification clauses. Um, okay, so uh, to more happier things, <laughs> this is a um, you know, revised um, you know edition uh, provision, uh, and this could be um, an issue for authors because God forbid anything ever happens to you, um, you know, they want to make sure that they're able to pick the author. That will write the, the revised you know edition or if you can't do it for any reason and then the other reason why it's important for authors is that sometimes the publisher will say that okay we're going to hire somebody else but they're going to take some of your royalties of course no author wants that so what i try to do is say okay if someone else is going to write it the author is at least going to get consultation as to who they can pick but also that author is only to get a, a flat fee they're not going to get you know a uh a, a, a royalty um, and that's what all this you know, language you know, states here, essentially. Um, uh, next is you know, author's property. Um, and this is, I guess, for people in the, the Stone Age, but you know, uh, they're essentially saying anything that's lost or damaged um, isn't going to be the publisher's fault. So um, you know, make sure you have backup copies. Um, what some of my agent clients do is that they will email me um, copies of their work. Uh, so you can email other people in your family, friends, um, you know, who you trust. Uh, you can also just make up an email address and email it there just in case anything ever happens to your, your email. Just of course, you get a, you know, a USB, do it that way, but just make sure that your work is backed up and that, you know, you won't, it won't be lost. Um, next are competitive works and we're going to go over options as well. This is also very important, especially for your writing career. Um, and you want to try to narrow this down as much as possible. Same thing for the option clause, or really just strike the option clause. That's what I try to do. But you want to narrow this down because uh, it really depends on, you know, uh, excuse me, it's, it's, it's uh, conditioned on, you know, what you can write about next, right? So if you're uh, trying to narrow down based on the subject matter or based on the depth um, that you've treated the subject, um, you know, for example, like say you've written an academic book on you know, whatever the subject is, um, you can claim that that competitive, the only thing that's going to be competitive is a work of that nature. 
you know, it won't be a general trade book of that subject. Um, or if you're writing with two people, you could say, um, um, you know, nothing is going to be competitive if I write something alone or with, with another author. Or what you can also do is say, um, you know, any articles that I write or blogs that I write um, about that subject, um, you know, aren't going to be deemed, you know, competitive uh, 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 works. And this happens a lot with like professors, you know, you know, you're a professor of history. That's what you do for a living. How are you not going to be able to write about, you know, uh, your specific area of history? So that's why they try to carve out language there. You try to narrow it down, you know, as much as possible. And of course, this, you try to do the same thing with option clauses. I hate option clauses. Uh, <laughs> it's just a pet peeve of mine. I think they're silly. Um, but you know they're essentially rights of first refusal. So they the the publisher gets uh, an option at your next work, and they write it in very very general, and they say that they have an option to to acquire your next book length work. So if you plan on you know switching from nonfiction to fiction or fiction to nonfiction, they still have your option. So I try to strike this, and if I can't strike it, I try to narrow it down. And the reason why I don't like this is because a lot of option clauses are written in a way where if you bring the material to the publisher and they don't like it, you can go elsewhere and try to get it published. But if you get another offer, sometimes the publisher may have a right to match that offer. And I always think like, if you didn't want it in the first place, why, why would you want it You know, down the line? Oh, now you see value because another publisher wanted it. So what I try to do is narrow down the sort of the, um, the delivery um, requirements so, you know, I'll say like for a nonfiction book, um, you know, we'll give you a general outline and maybe a chapter. Um, you know, we're not going to, you're not going to require us to write three to four chapters um, and that, you know, we're going to be able to submit this to you, uh, you know, a month after, you know, publication. Uh, so that's what I try to do if they're not, if they're not going to reject it, but I try to reject it, you know, outright, but it also really just depends on the publisher. You know, if you're at a big five or a bigger press, uh, you might want to keep going with them. You might love your relationship. Even if you're a smaller press, you might love the, the relationship that, that you have with them. It just becomes an issue when, you know, your relationship sours with the publisher. And that happens a lot. So, um, you know, if you think, you know, you want to have the maximum flexibility, then, you know, you want to try to um, uh, 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 really just X out the, <laughs> the provision from your, your contract. Okay, so that's the option. Then there's out of prints excuse me, out of print. Um, and this is another thing that is very um, sort of formulaic uh, in that um, out of print clauses, um, a lot of times publishers will say your work will be in print if there's any edition of your work in print, um, which technically um, uh, is print on demand as well. So it's technically never out of print. So what I try to do is narrow it down to say that um, to be out of print, it, that has to deal with print copies rather than than digital uh, 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 copies. Usually, what happens is that you'll tell the publisher the book's out of print. I want to revert my rights, and then it gives them a certain amount of months here, let's say six months, to put the book uh, back in print. And if they don't do that, then um, the rights will will revert back to you. So I try to narrow it down to print books, and then I also try to number to narrow it down by the number of copies. So if I say I don't know, uh, 100 copies haven't been sold in the last two accounting periods. You know, print on, what I, usually in the languages, print on paper, English language edition, um, you know, 100 copies. Um, if that hasn't been sold in two accounting periods, for example, um, then I try to, um, that's how I try to narrow it down. Then there's remaindering. So, you know, if your book is get out of print, you may want to try to buy the remaining copy. Um, excuse me, the remaining copies. And that just you know that the royalty payable upon copy sold those remainder shall be 10% of the amount received minus manufacturing costs. So there's a whole formula in terms of how much you would have to pay in terms of getting that. Then there's termination. Um, so either party breaches the agreement and fails to cure, um, you know, the publisher, you know, the, some of these are, you know, really ways that the author can terminate the agreement. So A, the publisher fails to publish your work on time. Usually it's 12 it's it was 12 to 18 months then with the pandemic went from 18 to 24 months and now it's getting back towards 18 months the publisher goes bankrupt you can terminate it um they don't pay you royalties um or their sub rights you know the dates required yeah. but you know if they're a day late you know you're not going to terminate it um or the agent doesn't receive the royalty statements by the the date required so yeah if, if, if i haven't received anything in like 30 days 60 days 90 days that's a problem 
I haven't received it in one or two days. Okay, I'll let that slide. Uh, and then lastly, there are miscellaneous provisions. Um, it's governing law. Most publishers are in New York. But I shouldn't say that. You know, there are publishers all over the country, but you know, most of the bigger publishers are in New York. Um, so, um, yeah, make sure, you know, you look at this. So in case anything does happen, you'll see A, what law the courts will look at if there's ever a lawsuit, but then also where you have to go um, in, in case there ever is a lawsuit. So that this is a uh, choice of law, and then this is choice of forum. Um, and then you can see here that any disputes uh, will be adjudicated in Westchester County in New York. But there's an assignment. So as a writer, this is, you know, you're essentially performing a services agreement. So you can't assign your right to write the book um, to someone else, but you could assign payment to a third party, for example. So I'm making it up, say all proceeds to your book are gonna go to a, um, a charity of your choice. You could assign payment to a third party. And there are headings, that, this gets into the weeds of contracts, but essentially, Courts look at, or judges look at, uh, you know, at, at the first outset, they look at the four corners of the agreement. Um, essentially, they look at the language in the agreement and they look to anything that would give them a sense of how to interpret the agreement if there's an issue. And we put this in here to say that the headings, um, you know, governing law, assignment, headings, royalties, subrights, they're just for convenience and reference only. They're not actually part of the agreement. They won't affect the agreement in any way. And there's notice, essentially, um, you write down your address, and this is how they will uh, communicate with you if there's, you know, any, you know, legal communication, for example, if there's any lawsuit, um, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time, you'll be getting emails from your, your editor, but it's it's there. And then there's severability, essentially means that if any provision in the agreement remains, um, excuse me, if any provision in the agreement is declared invalid, um, or it's unforceable, it's illegal, the remainder of the contract is still going to remain intact. Um, then there's merger, which is essentially stating any, you know, and this is important because I, I've had this happen before. Um, no matter what you state in an email or a phone call, whether it's oral or in writing, um, you know, if if a publisher says like, oh, I'm going to you know, do X, Y, or Z for you, uh, but then it's not in the contract, that original promise isn't going to mean anything. The merger provision is here to say that this is the final contract and this is going to supersede any written or oral statements or agreements that you've had before um and that's that's really it so um i know that was a ton of information <laughs> so much so, and and joe yes. this is i just have to and everybody grab joe's contact information and it'll all come to you in a follow-up email um the, the amount of information is, it's been so rich and deep. And I know for, um, I speak for everybody to say thank you for this mm -hmm. because you of just, course. you kind of wrapped your arms around all of it. And I know I speak on behalf of um, so many of us who have gone through uh, legal discussion or webinar in the past. The first time you go through one of these, it's overwhelming. And you mm -hmm. literally, as Joe alluded to, kind of feel like I don't even want to step foot into this arena anymore because there's so many risks and there's so many problem areas and roadblocks that I might be able to hit. What I would say, and Joe and I were talking about this before this, um, and then we'll do a quick Q&A, by all means, write your book and write your story and write your authentic story and know that this stuff will be dealt with, but you know the art has to come and the facts mm. and your your process need to come without you know putting this stuff so much in front of you that you you can't do it but mm -hmm. just know that there are professionals there are literary agents there are attorneys like joe mm -hmm. there are people like your forever editor at your publisher who are going to help you walk through this stuff but it's so helpful to have a sense of what could be coming down the pike so that if you're really wrestling with something that's just like do i even include this this might help you decide uh, whether to take a different tact altogether in, in your work. Um, but, but yes, Joe, thank you. Yeah, and, of, and of course, of and course. Uh, I, I know that I, I mentioned to everybody at the outset and I mentioned it in the chat too, but just as a quick reminder for anybody who submitted a question earlier during registration, Joe is going to take a look at all of those and, um, email us with, and you'll get an email that has not only re the recording of this, but, Joe's, you know, general comments, all disclaimers aside about this is not legal advice, but 
just, you know, for a lot of the things that a lot of us are thinking about in terms of the questions, mm-hmm. um, he'll give his his two cents on what mm-hmm. to expect or, or how to look at a certain topic. But um, Joe, how how much time do you have for some Q&A? Because I know those who've hung on this long probably have some burning questions. Yeah. And <laughs> and thank you all for staying uh, a bit yeah. later. But um, what, what what time is it? Sorry, I just don't have my... Uh, it is one forty one right now. Forty one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, oh, great. Fantastic. Um, okay. uh, so yeah, yeah, I have plenty of time. But yeah, I just wanted to, before we get into it, I just want to piggyback but, um, on sort of what you were saying. Um, but I always look at it like, think just all the good things that could happen with publishing your book rather than these these scary things. I mean, most of the time, you're not going to run into any of these issues. Um, you know, mo- you know uh, knock on wood. <laughs> but, uh, you know, if you ever if you ever do, you know, there are resources here. So I just, I don't, I, I hope this doesn't like scare you into not writing anything, but just think of all the good things. There are resources to u- utilize the resources. Essentially is what I'm getting at. Awesome. To, to um, you know, write your book and publish it. So anyway. Well, can I, I will, I will just kick off with one um, question that I suspect a lot of people might have, and it's regarding right of privacy, especially yeah. particularly disclosure of private and embarrassing facts. Yeah. Um, most notably because many of us are writing memoir yeah. and, you know, if you come up against a situation where there has been either, you know, horrifyingly either a sexual assault of some sort or something that has happened to you a rape or or you're talking about something that is either it's already been published or written about in the press you know mm-hmm. it's it's beyond alleged you know it's it's been somebody's been convicted whatever the case is yeah. are you or are we permitted to write about that knowing that the um perpetrator, you know, or the mm-hmm. guilty as charged person might come back and say, I don't want you to write about this. This was, you know, right. something that I did in the past and I don't want it stirred up again or, or what right. have you. Right. How do you handle as a writer, as an author, mm-hmm. those sort of situations where? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm happy to, to, to respond. So it all depends on the context. So if the person has been convicted I, I just think of like, you know, think of your run of the day mobster. <laughs> uh, they're essentially libel proof. You know, what can you possibly say about that person that you, you know, people aren't, you, you're not going to libel them. You know, they're, they're a mobster um, or, you know, somebody has been convicted of sexual assault or, or, um, you know, another, another crime. If it's public, that's one thing. It's when it isn't public and it's being alleged is the issue. Okay. And this is where it really becomes nuanced. This is where what I was uh, you know, talking about before, how, well, I, I, in terms of the risk, how likely is it that that person is going to sue you? That's essentially a question you really have to ask yourself. And you may not know the answer to that. And if you don't know the answer to that, or you want to be more conservative, um, what you can do is you try to anonymize the person as, as much as possible. Uh, you try to get rid of any, and th- this is sort of the, the issue that authors run into because you want to write authentically, right? Um, and tell your truth. Uh, but sometimes if you write things that, you know, if you're alleging somebody committed a crime, that might be liable per se. They don't even have to prove it. Um, they can just come in here. You allege that I committed a crime. I never did this. Um, so there's um, uh, the, the characteristics, the, the details that you have to worry about. Um, and then there's also proof. If you have proof, <laughs> defense, you know, truth is always a defense, right? If you have proof, if you have documentary evidence, you have other types of proof, that can help you. It's when you don't have proof is when, at least in my eyes, when it becomes more problematic because it's a he said, he said, she said type of thing. So um, that's why if you, worst case scenario, you don't have any proof to, you know, to, to say it's true. Um, that's when you want to try to anonymize it as much as possible. And that's really all you you could do. Um, uh, and this is, I think, where it helps to rather than self-publish, try to get a traditional publisher um, because they can, there is case law, um, you know, that says that, you know, because the publisher would get sued too, but if they truly believe what you said is true, they can stand behind your book. Um so there's sort of that cheerleading aspect to it. Um, you know, it doesn't really do anything for you sort of legally, but it's there like you, you sort of, you know, you could, you know, talk to the the publisher and talk to the the counsel 
um, rather than yourself. Or even if you just spoke to me, if you're self-publishing it, you just, you have a lot of cooks in the kitchen, so to speak, to run di- you know different ideas and how to get around it. Um, so anyway, it's thank you. all nuanced. It's all. Yeah, all of course. Of course. Well, thank you. Thank you. And, mm-hmm. um, questions, I guess we can just sort of put some hands up and, and see if people still have questions after all of that information. Um, and, and by all means, if not, please don't feel obligated to stay, but, <laughs> um, I see Barbara raising her hand. So I'm just going to pick where I pick. Uh, <laughs> let's see. I'm going to unmute. Barbara, uh, or if Barbara, if you can unmute yourself as I'm. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Christine, my, my wolf sister. I got my wolf. (laughs) (laughs) wolf, wolf Uh Writers uh, and Wesley writers. So, so happy to be here. Wow. Joe, this is amazing stuff. Christine, this is so great. I thank you guys both. And uh, Thanks you for know, being I here. Up, uh, having a book that just a me- I wrote a memoir called Reconfigured that came out in July and boy by the beginning of August I saw on uh, both Goodreads and Amazon.com that there was a somebody on Amazon was selling a book that they was saying you know by this guy's name that says summary of Reconfigured a memoir. Hmm. Wait, somebody took your information and is repackaging it? it? Yes. Why would anyone need a summary of my memoir? It's not like cliff notes for a college course, right? But, you know, um, that is apparently the a type of pirating, you know, Mm -hmm. ripping people off that way. And it and I only looked at I couldn't I should go back and read because it has even one of those see inside things on Amazon. So I looked at the beginning and was like, this is a summary of my book. And it actually was, I thought maybe it was written by AI because it wasn't bad, Mm. but it also is just other people have said, it's just usually a compilation of the summary, like on the back of your book or wherever. And the reviews that people said, they just throw that together and they try to sell it for for money, 1099 or something like. Wow. So are you asking what is your recourse or have you? Right. You know that I guess when I asked Amazon to take it down, they said no. And uh, it doesn't say right, but I don't know if it's illegal, I guess. Yeah. And Um, one question, are you self-published or? uh, um, I'm published with She Writes Press, which is a hybrid. Right. Oh yeah, I know she writes. Um, oh, who's the head of it? I've spoken to her before. Brooke Brooke Warner. Warner. Brooke, yes. Um, yeah, I would speak to the publisher because um, you know. I did. Yeah. What did What did they say? Oh, she said, "See page seventy of the She Writes Press Handbook, which said, <laughs> of course, um, <laughs> that yeah. What was my recourse? Oh, that you can ask Amazon and Goodreads to remove it, and you can also what some enterprising uh. She writes press author had done was write a bad give it one star because you have to give it yeah. a star I guess it, and say a bad review it, and letting people know that it's a ripoff and yeah. and that mm-hmm. did trigger Amazon to remove it I, I was you know according to Brooke yeah but in my case Amazon came back and said no it's we're not so we're leaving it happened to my client uh, as an agent uh the same exact thing. Um, and, uh, I don't, I, I, I don't think she's, I don't think it's been taken down. Um, but essentially she, you know, she was annoyed by it and, uh, you know, but, uh, at the end of the day, she decided I'm just going to move on from just, you know, it's a summary, but if, you know, yeah, I don't think she wrote a bad review and she's a good idea, but I just think she essentially, if there's, if they're not going to take it down, I don't know what else you could, you could really do. Yeah, that was just, I was kind of in shock as a new author. That's my first book to think someone would do that and then could do, but other, now it doesn't, I don't even think about it, but I just thought, you know, I just see if you had, you know, had any thoughts and it sounds like part of it happening. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, it's really just an Amazon type of thing. I get these questions all the time uh, in terms of Amazon did this, Amazon did that. Like, and you know, you, I don't, I, I, I can't call them and tell them do this or that. It's really, it's you know, it's Amazon. They're gonna, they're gonna do it or not do it. So, um, well, thank you, Joe. Yeah, yeah, of course. I'm sorry, but yeah. Uh, yeah. I, other than wow. Writing a review, wow. Okay. Um, it looks like Phyllis has a question, so maybe Phyllis can jump in. I'm gonna try to unmute Hi, Phyllis. you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hi. Thanks, Joe. This has been crazy good. Um, <laughs> but, mm-hmm. So I'm going to at some I'm writing a memoir. I'm hope to go with a traditional publisher. Yeah. 
but I'm not that far along yet. But when I send my manuscript out to beta readers, mm -hmm. there's some kind of a something I should have them sign to keep, you know, to protect my book from them. I don't know, copying it or distributing right. it. Right. So, so I get this question sort of in a number of different ways. And I get, I get asked as an agent to sign NDAs and I never sign them. Um, NDAs, uh, non-disclosure agreement. Yeah, yeah. And the reason why I never do it's just, it's just not how things work in, in publishing. You're already protected in that you have, um, you've written your memoir. It's complete. It's the final, or even if it's not the final copy, you, you have a copyright in your memoir. Right. If you register it, it's protected. They can't steal it from you. If someone if someone took your memoir and then published it, you'd have a claim for copyright infringement. So you don't need to, um, at least in my opinion, if you go do those things, then you don't need to have them sign okay. you know, an NDA. Yeah. Cool. That yeah. makes things easier. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. yep. Awesome. I'm going to, before we get to Kristen, I'm just going to say, I know Lisa had submitted a question earlier and she added it in the chat. And this is about... Um, it's it's a specific question. Um, she was a right for hire. Um, oh, yes. mm -hmm. And it, Joe and I talked about that a little bit before. Is this the question you were saying? Um, you were thinking about, I, I, I thought I heard. Um, oh, I'd have to speak to to, to uh, Lisa individually. There's just, it's very, very factual. <laughs> right, right, specific. right. Yes. It sounded yeah. like a more complex, yeah, um, more yeah. specific uh, question that she had that was mm. was definitely one that was more in depth that you would mm. speak to her individually. Mm. So, um, Lisa, I hope you heard that because that's it's a great question and it sounds meaty and probably more more time mm. would mm. take here. But thank you for sharing that because it's a really important one. Mm. Um, it thank sounds you. awful, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, Kristen, you've got a question. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you so much for this today. This has been great. I have written a memoir. I'm a first time author. I host a podcast. My platform is small. It's very niche. Um, I doubt I've, I've queried some agents. I haven't had luck. I've had some direct conversations um, with some big five publishers who requested fulls, but no luck there. So I'm probably going to go either small hybrid or self-publishing. Um, I naturally, the memoir deals with a an ex-husband uh, mm -hmm. as an inciting incident. He was closeted. Mm -hmm. He is out now. Okay. Um, there is no crime alleged, but there is bad behavior alleged, mm -hmm. and there is that is absolutely pivotal to the plot of the the book. And uh, there is, I have two essentially, I don't know what you would call them, character witnesses who were present during the time of the events that. Should he? I mean, I've been on, I've been hosting a podcast for six years on the subject of mixed orientation mm -hmm. marriage, mm -hmm. and um, and I would imagine that if he was going to, I I don't talk about my story on the podcast. I interview mm -hmm. other people who've been in mixed orientation marriages. I might mm -hmm. tangentially mention some of my experience, but I imagine that if he was going to sue me, he would have sued me over something I may have said one day on the podcast. So I I have changed his name, obviously. Mm -hmm may not be adequate i also i also discuss explicit sex scenes because it's pertinent to talk mm -hmm. about what it's like to have sex with a gay man so mm -hmm. um so i just want to i guess i plan on forming an llc if i mm -hmm. self publish um but if there's anything else i mean the the low hanging fruit that i could change all the events took place in atlanta it's set in atlanta i could move it somewhere else mm -hmm. um, but my thing is, if anybody wanted to know who my ex-husband was, I mean, how hard is that for somebody to look right. up? You know, I, that, that's my really, really, right. uh, you know, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, what you could do, I mean, I know it's a memoir, but you can also have a pseudonym as well. Uh, it's just, you know, the, I guess sort of the issue behind that, I, I think it comes towards really marketing and publicity. So if you're, you know, you're on social media, everyone knows it's you. <laughs> Uh, so and yeah, I already have a podcast that I yeah. produce under my own name and yeah. the disassociation with, you know, I'm writing a memoir about mm -hmm. mixed orientation marriage. I have a podcast about mixed orientation. I yeah. mean, it just seems like I'm committed. So just mm -hmm. go ahead and take the Yeah. Risk. Yeah. I mean, this is where really the risk assessment comes. I mean, how off, how likely do you think he would, you know, come after you and I mean, what, I mean, yes, you're writing about those, those, you know, private moments 
Um, but you know, I, I think if you know, if you don't think he's going to come after you, or there's a less of a chance, you now you may want to take on on that risk. And this is where, where I would get you know author's insurance if if he does. And you know, this is where it's sort of what comes into the uh, the legal case. Let's just say worst case scenario, he does sue you. Um, you know, this is where you bring in witnesses and, and everything, you know, the whole full, you know, nine yards. And would a reasonable person believe that they um, uh, defamed him, that you defamed him or you violated his his privacy? I mean, in terms of, you know, defamation, if he's already out, I don't see how that would be defamation, well, right? Interestingly, one of the witnesses is his second wife. Mm. <laughs> married. Okay had a very similar experience and she features in the book with her permission Mm. so i mean that could sort of and if if he were to catch wind of the book if he were to i I don't necessarily think he wouldn't sue me but i do think with her backup of corroboration of my story he would back away i think so yeah yeah i mean really like i said it comes it's it comes down to a risk assessment like i had you know a claim i I obviously can't get into the details but essentially she said if i write this i'm gonna get sued so we had to tread incredibly lightly and eliminate a ton of material so there's also that aspect to it as well like but you're saying if it's so integral to the book sort of this catch-22 right so maybe there, you know at this instance you know you can really only do you know, you can only do, you know, so much to protect yourself, write a disclaimer, um, you know, it, 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 you know, it essentially says that identities have been changed to protect privacy. They're self-serving They're you know, just because you have one in there doesn't mean you're, you're not going to get sued, but they at least show a court that you made a good faith attempt, change the locales. I know people can see that it might be him, but in this instance, there's really only so much that you can do. So it really just comes down to, am I willing to take on this risk? Uh, to publish this, yeah, okay, and get okay. the ins- and get insurance. Yeah, thank you, mm-hmm. thank you for that question. That was really that's a compelling one, and mm-hmm. um, I'm looking for any mm-hmm. last questions before oh, yeah. we. Yeah. This will be the last one. Yeah, I gotta get yeah, <laughs> I realize three. Leave. And thank yeah. you, thank you. Um, I don't see any other hands up. Call out if you have one, but uh, Joe, thank you for all this time and energy that you put into this. I know that having this stuff uh, later on too, to go back to just to feel less Mm -hmm. unfamiliar with the language is a really empowering Mm -hmm. thing. And these explanations make it a lot more accessible for us because we're so focused on writing, (laughs) writing a different kind of language, Uh but um, of course, I'm looking oh, in the chat. Yeah, please. I, I, I forgot one thing in terms of libel and right of privacy. I don't even know why I didn't re- write this, but this may help people that with libel and right of privacy, you can't libel the dead. And it's same thing for right of privacy. So it really only pertains to living individuals. So I know I, I don't know how I didn't mention that at the outset, but um, uh, that may help someone. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if they're, if you no, think they're that, defined. Yeah. So, no, that's um, really helpful, particularly yeah. what I'm, what I'm writing about too. Um, mm-hmm. um, so Thank you all for spending this time. And uh, for those of you who are seeing the recording later, uh, thanks for for taking the time to go through this presentation because I know Joe um, is a fantastic resource and I hope you all reach out to him. There's his contact information and thank Thanks you so all much. for being here. It really, it was a, it was a great yes. discussion. Thank, thank you, you so everybody. Much. Have a really great Saturday. It. You too. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.